start to look within. Like when you're in that position, I think so many people are going outwards and trying to get that person back instead of thinking, why do I need that person in my life? Why am I aching so much just to get their approval? Instead, it's about taking that time to break that cycle. It can happen in domestic violence. It can happen in relationships and it can happen in narcissistic abuse relationships as well. You are scared of the abandonment. And so you pull a person in and that makes the person run. Then you try and pull them back and it's this terrible cycle. And once you break the cycle and you spend time working on yourself and thinking about ways that you can be secure in yourself, that's the only way you can have a real relationship. Welcome to another episode of Negotiate Your Best Life. I'm so excited today to welcome somebody really, really special, really, really amazing. She's so fierce and so powerful and so beautiful. She's so beautiful on the inside and the outside. And she she came to be a household name in a number of ways. First, way back in the day, uh, during 9-11, which we're going to talk about that. And then also she came to uh, be a household name when the whole Tiger Woods thing blew up, which we're, we can't talk about because she had an NDA, but she was the one that Tiger was with and the whole thing about that. But Rachel, you could tell, is actually a woman of many traits, many talents. She is brilliant. She's an entrepreneur. She's a media personality. She's a podcast host. She has her own high-end clothing company. She has a uh, podcast called Misunderstood, which I actually was just privileged to be on. And she has all sorts of things going on. So, and she has a beautiful daughter. So we're going to be talking about her life and we're going to be talking about her life with some narcissists in her life as well. So welcome and thank you for being here. Of course. What an intro. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. So you first actually uh, came into the news during 9-11 and talk about that. You were holding a picture of your fiance and what happened there? Yeah. I mean, uh, I was 26 years old. I was working at Bloomberg news. Um, and I was engaged to a guy I'd been dating for three years. His name was James Andy O'Grady. He went by Andy and uh, he was at work that day. I went into work at 5 a.m. He went into work at 6.30, probably. We had just gotten back from Greece, so we were up really early. And he was killed in the World Trade Center. And that photo that became, uh, it was known as New York's Tragic Face. It's in some museums. And, um, you know, it was in, in almost on the cover of almost every newspaper in the world um, a couple of days after September 11th, um, was taken when I was at Bellevue Hospital searching for Andy, they had said that his name was on a list of, uh, one of the people that was found, they kept making mistakes. So that was actually common. So people would line up at hospitals, check to see if their loved one's name was on the list. Everyone would be told no. And then they'd walk away. So that was where that photo was taken when I was at Bellevue. Mm. And you ended up taking like a month off to find him or something, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, so September 11th was a Tuesday by Sunday. I was asked to be on Fox news and I did an interview with them. And I remember them asking me as this 26 year old girl who had just lost her, the love of her life and had no information, like didn't know. And people are still talking about like having hope. And I remember them saying, well, do you think that he's still alive under the rubble? And I remember thinking like, hope is the thing that kills you kind of, you know, like, no, I'm smarter than that. If you look at what happened, there's no way that, that he is alive. And for me to hold out hope would just be stupid. So I didn't search for him for a month, but I definitely had to take a month off to like figure out how to like breathe kind of, again, it was all very surreal. And I will say it, it, it was, not as hard the first month because everyone was going through it and everyone was, there was so many questions and that was the only thing that anyone was talking about. So I didn't feel alone in losing him. 
Um, the worst part was when everyone left. Like I didn't spend one night alone for a month. Like my mom was there. My two friends were there. My, my best friends at the time. And, um, his friends were always over and the phone was always ringing, but it gets lonely when the phone stops ringing, when everyone else goes back to their life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went back to work and it was really hard for me to go back to work because everyone was like going about their life, like nothing happened when my life was totally changed. So, um, yeah, obviously that was something that, that, um, affected me forever. It's like in my bones, you know, it's something that I, it'll never, uh, d the pain will never diminish from how I feel, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So then from there, you decided to get married. Um, about a year or two years later, maybe, um, I'm trying to remember the date actually. So I ended up marrying a childhood friend who had had a similar um, story. He was like, he worked in finance, but he happened to be at Cantor Fitzgerald that day and uh, had an early interview because he was trying to interview before, you know, so he could go before work. So his work wouldn't know that he was interviewing. And he had just gotten out of the elevator when the plane struck everyone that he had the meeting with that morning. So we hadn't spoken since we were like 14 years old somehow we connected later, you know, like maybe a year later, we connected about our stories and we became best friends. And I ended up marrying him literally as a friend. Like we really were very platonic. It was weird. And I thought that that might be the right way to marry someone, like just to not, not be vulnerable enough where I was completely in love with them. Right. Cause I was so scared of losing someone. I had already lost my father when I was 15 years old. He was 44. He was, he had died of a cocaine addiction. Then mm. I lose Andy, who was like, you know, the guy who loves me unconditionally. And so I think the next time around, I was like, okay, I'm not going to put everything into this person. So a year after marrying him, um, I, uh, I, I think that's so September 11th, I think I married him three years later. So I think that, um, you know, I, a year later I said, I think we should get a divorce that I want a love story and this is not it. We're just friends. So, um, you know, I remember reading about that in the paper and it said something like, oh, I couldn't even keep the marriage lasting or whatever, but that wasn't true. It was just, we were friends. We weren't meant to be married. Hmm. And so, you, you, you know, do you think that you were trying to like heal yourself or something like that? I mean, what do, you, what do you think that you were like, I think in that circumstance, I just felt very close to him and felt like he had gone through something that no other people had been through, even though he didn't lose, you know, he lost people that he knew, of course, but he was there that day. I don't know. I just felt very close. Plus I knew him from my childhood. So I just felt a bond with him. Mm. Um, but you know, after that relationship is where I've kind of gone awry. I mean, you know, that, that one obviously didn't work out, but you know, I've picked different people, you know, I think my self-worth every time went lower and lower, but at the same time, my belief that men would stay because of a choice or because of something terrible that happened, um, was like, you know, off the rails. I didn't really know what was true. And I think, you know, it's so interesting. I'm 49 years old. I have not, been remarried. I have a child with someone, um, who is a very difficult relationship, even though I was only with them for two years or whatever. And I've had many relationships since, and I have a bad picker. I've, uh, you know, since mm -hmm. that occasion, I have made terrible decisions based on people who give me credibility. I think in my eyes, um, you know, picking very powerful men. And if everyone in the room wants to know them and they want to know me and they want to, you know, they love me, then I must be worthy. So th that's how I justified who I was with. And then, you know, when you pick people like that, that are powerful, you tend to get people that have narcissistic personality traits. Um, some of them may be diagnosed with it if they actually took the time to, you know, go see someone, but a lot of them just haven't been diagnosed, but really possess these traits where, you know, they have so many traits that are, that they, that they consume you with, you know, you lose your sense of self because you, you remember what it was like when you first met and how intoxicating that was and how it made you feel. And then they make you feel the pendulum swing of the complete opposite and terrible, but you almost can't be without them because they convince you that you're nobody without them. And where do you think you're going? And, you know, um, and you convince yourself that, that no one else will want you. And this is as good as it's going to get. And when he's 
great. He's great when he's bad. He's terrible. So there are so many, you know, aspects to that. And the gaslighting is terrible. And, um, but I think subconsciously too, I've had a history of growing up with a narcissistic mother. And so I think that I am used to that kind of, um, relationship and that kind of chaos and that kind of, um, interaction back and forth. And that like zero to a hundred and anger and negativity and, um, a ab- verbal abuse in some ways, emotional abuse. So it, I, I hate saying it felt comfortable, but it so almost it's felt familiar. It's familiar. Yeah, familiar. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I, ha- sorry to interrupt you. It almost felt like that's what I assumed love was. Cause if some guy wasn't going like this up and down with me, if they were like, you know, s- straight arrow, there was no emotion. That's how I read it, that they must not love me if they're not being passionate and there's no pull and push and tug and breaking up and making up and calling me names and then being like, Oh, I love you so much. I can't live without you. So, you know, I think if I didn't possess that in a relationship, I thought there was something wrong with it. Mm. So insightful. I mean, you actually went on celebrity rehab because Dr. Drew said that you were a love addict. Yeah. So I had never heard that term. And I remember when he came to me and uh, asked me to be on the show. I, I was asked by Donald Trump to be on the apprentice. And I said, yes, um, because I really wanted people to get to know who I was, but as it got closer, I got very nervous about how I would be edited. I thought that it could be, it could go really negatively. Um, but I wanted to do it because I was able to, I forget what the word is play or whatever my, my, um, cause was for the red cross. And to me, that was a big deal. And Donald had told me that, Nobody had uh, used that as a charity. And because of September 11 and what they had done for me after I lost my fiance, they gave me a hundred thousand dollars for me to move out of my apartment and, and put towards an apartment to buy from me, which was amazing. I mean, I just, it saved my life. So, um, because my apartment was like kicking me out cause I couldn't pay the rent cause my fiance was paying the rent, you know, like it was just weird, but anyway, um, I really wanted to do the apprentice and, um, Dr. Drew came and said, uh, I, I think you should be on my show. Uh, I said, but I'm not an addict. And he said, well, you are, you're a love addict. So when he explained it to me and I started to understand what it was and I started to, you know, and I sat with, with Drew uh, and felt this connection to Drew and I felt seen, I was like, there's no way that I don't need this for real. So I went into that show taking it completely seriously. And I will say, you know, for people that don't believe that reality shows are real, I don't know about other ones. I've only been on millionaire matchmaker, which was not real. I can say, but celebrity rehab was completely real. The eight people that I was there with were going through, um, withdrawals. They were trying to get through their traumas for those 30 days. I think we filmed for 21. So for those 21 days, we were, uh, taking it very seriously, even though the cameras were there. And, um, two people out of the eight has, have actually died since from drug overdoses, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, but, but I remember thinking, oh, everyone's here for the, for the money. But then after I was in it for a while, I said, but who gives a shit? It might've been what took them to get off the drugs to come here, but they were really doing the work. So I appreciated being on that show. And I got to learn a lot about love addiction. And I, um, dealt with a lot of the loss in my life and why, I make choices based on the trauma I had from relationships in my childhood. And I went on tour with Dr. Drew a little bit and we went on the Joy Behar show and all sorts of shows talking about love addiction and trying to bring awareness to it. Mm. Do you think that it helped you? Do you feel like- for sure. I mean, I think it's become more of a, a, you know, people know the term now. Back then I was like, wait a minute, you mean sex addict? Like, you know, I I didn't know the difference. I didn't really know what that was. So yeah, I, I- I learned a lot from it. I feel like I still call upon it today. The tools that I have learned from doing so much work with it, the books I've read on it. I think, you know, anyone who's not familiar with love addiction should, you know, it's basically in simplest form, people that replace love for intensity. Um, And so, you know, they think that this intense relationship is really love when it's really toxic and uh, it makes you lose your sense of self and you're like addicted to this, um, toxicity, you know, and the, and the ups and downs. So, you know, I, uh, I appreciated everything that I learned from it. And again, I, I mean, I still have all the books on my shelf in my office here that, um, I've had for years and once in a while I'll flip through them and 
Um, I recommend them to my friends all the time because I know so many girls who can't get through a day when they're going through a breakup or something in their relationship. And I'm always like, okay, you're, you're acting like a little bit of a love addict right now. Let's, let's look at this and why you're acting this way. So what are some of the things that you learned? Well, you know, I learned how to identify, you know, some of the traits I learned, you know, who, who preys on love addicts. Um, it's, it's, you know, I learned a lot about the attachment and, you know, what we fear as somebody abandoning us is usually, you know, what ends up happening because we pick the wrong people who are usually love addicts pick sex addicts or some other addicts. Right. And then, um, we, we feel this hole, uh, is filled by them. And then when that hole is empty, we, we, you know, try and get them back so bad because we think that we need them. Um, and also the concept of, you know, somebody will appear in your life and it's almost like you put a mask over their head. You don't listen to anything that they're saying. You don't see their red flags or green flags. You just superimpose what you assume to be, uh, what you need. Right. So I think a lot of people do this on dating apps. They'll see a picture and they'll see a name and they'll see where they live. And they might be like, Oh my God, this one is the one. <laughs> and they'll like come up with an idea of who they think the person is. Right. And then as they date them and time goes on, they get disappointed by things that maybe they really shouldn't because they superimpose that on that person. And that was never who that person was. So I think there's a lot of that that goes on. And, but when you get to a point that you cannot function in your day, in your work, in your parenting, because you're so consumed by your relationship, that's when you need to take a step back and, you know, look within yourself to figure out why your sense of happiness and worth is based on the way someone else is interacting with you. So what do you do at that point? What was, what give, give us some of the tools that you learned. Um, so basically, I mean, you know, I think that it's important to start to look within, like when you're in that position, I think so many people are going outwards and trying to get that person back instead of thinking, why do I need that person in my life? Why, why am I aching so much just to get their approval? Instead, it's about taking that time to understand, you know, to break that cycle. Um, and that's the biggest thing, the cycle that happens, um, where the, it's a pull and, and push and pull, um, you know, it can happen in domestic violence. It can happen in relationships and it can happen in narcissistic abuse relationships as well. Um, because you know, you, you are scared of the abandonment. Um, and so you, you pull person in and that makes the person run and, you know, then you try and pull them back. And it's this, it's this terrible cycle. And once you break the cycle and you spend time working on yourself and thinking about, um, ways that you can be secure in yourself, um, that's the only way you can have a real relationship. So for me, the tools are when I realize, um, you know, like recently I was, uh, I met someone online and I started to date them and he checked, you know, when people ask me why, Oh my God, I really like this guy, you know, and they'd say, why? Well, he checks all these boxes. Okay. Well, after four months, I really didn't know anything about him. Like I'm telling you now, like I thought maybe four days ago, I was like in love with this person. I couldn't tell you one thing about them because, you know, I superimposed all these things on him and I started to realize I'm becoming a love addict. I'm addicted to the feeling of being in love when I don't even know if this person is worthy of my love, right. Or worthy of me. And, and, you know, it's those feelings of like, Oh my God, this person knows me so well. And, you know, we get, you know, we just feel like we knew each other in another life and we're so bonded to each other. Well, that's not healthy because they need to get to know you. They need to understand who you are as a person. Um, sometimes you don't even understand who you are as a person. So it's important to keep your identity while you date someone else. Cause if you lose your identity, it's just going to be a whole mess and your happiness. I mean, that's the thing that I want to stress. Your own happiness has to derive from you and your life. Otherwise you will end up ultimately being unhappy. Even if you pick a great partner, because they can't always make you happy. They're not always going to be in a great state in their own sense of self, you know? So, um, I think it all starts to answer your question with you and taking a step back and realizing like, what do I need to do to be in a happy place? in my life and not keep <clears throat> like trying to find uh, the love or the attachment or the fulfilling um, things from other people. And so anyway, this guy kept kind of, you know, not having meaningful conversations with me and just wanting to get close physically. And, um, 
you know, doing things that were red flags. And finally I, I, uh, said to him, I couldn't even get him to call me, you know? Um, and he, I finally said, listen, I, and this to me was a big step step. And it reminded me of something that I read in one of my books that you have to have boundaries. Like that was the biggest thing. And I said, listen, I know my worth. I got a little carried away here that, you know, we took it this far. I think that you must be a nice guy, but I'm really not bringing out qualities in you that are important to me, which is great communication skills and being reliable. And that's not happening here. So um, I want a love story and I don't think this is it. So, you know, good luck. And if it had been the right person, he would have come back and said, oh my God, you're misreading this. I'm so sorry. I didn't know you felt this way or whatever, but he didn't. And for a second, I was like, it was a little bit painful that he was like, okay, good luck to you too. But at the same time, I was like, okay, wait, I just stood up for myself. I stood up for, you know, what I thought was important and what I want. And, and everyone should know what is important to them and not settle for something that, that, they, you know, cannot settle for because that is um, ultimately what's going to make you happy and be an equal in a relationship. I'm very happy in my job. I'm very happy in my home. I'm very happy with my rescue dogs. I'm happy with my daughter. Obviously the one thing that's missing is a relationship. I just have to realize and keep reminding myself that, you know, it has to work in my life. I'm not going to work in their life. That's just not Mm. where I am in my stage. Like I want to make sure that we come together and we can share lives, but like, I'm not going to change 49 years old. I'm not changing something about me to go be with someone else. I am very happy with where I am. I just want someone who can contribute to that happiness, you know, and make it even better. Mm, They're so beautifully said. I love that. (laughs) So good. I love, love, love that. And I hope everybody who's listening to this goes back and listens to that because it was so beautifully said. <laughs> so good. So, so, so good. Um, and, and so it's really, truly finding that authentic version of yourself and breaking that trauma bond because mm-hmm. it really is a trauma bond. And I want to just go back to um, what you were talking about, that push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, um, because <clears throat> there is a dopamine um, addiction that happens in your brain. Mm-hmm. And I just want to make sure that I mention that on this episode. And I have mentioned that in other episodes in uh, my YouTube videos and also on my podcast, but I just want to make sure that I mention that here yeah. um, that, because it comes, you know, when you are on in that high and when you are having that moment of love and all of that, your brain emits dopamine. Mm. And that is the hormone of addiction. That's, that's what happens when, you know, you're playing these video games or you're, you're playing the slot machine or whatever it is that that comes, that comes out. And when, when you are in love and when that person is coming at you and you're talking about being soulmates or you're talking about knowing each other in a different lifetime or whatever, your brain is like dopamine, 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 and it's dumping that, uh, you know, at a massive rate. And, and it's like, they've actually measured it and it's higher than levels of cocaine at that time. And that's why when a narcissist or, or somebody like that, ghost you all this, all of a sudden and says, you know, I'm not going to call you right now. Or, you know, uh, you know, they, they go from a hundred texts a day or whatever it is to like zero and mm-hmm. why are you being so needy? And you know, I can't come right now or whatever it is. And, and now your body is like reacting to that. And, 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 uh, you know, now it's like cortisol, the stress hormone. And, yeah. and, and uh, it, you know, now your body is, is literally craving that person on a physiological level. Mm. So you actually become physiologically addicted to that person. And and that is why it is so hard to break that trauma bond. It Mm. is, it's, it's literally one of the hardest things to do in your life. It's so interesting that you're saying that because I felt exactly that. And I'm glad you're bringing this up because obviously what you're saying is much more clinical version of what I was saying. But, um, you know, I, I felt like, so he would be here with me and then he would go back to where he lived in a different state and the communication would go down and it would just be a couple texts a day. I miss you thinking of you. And I would get so excited hearing that. Right. And then, but I would want more. I would want to know what he was doing. And if he was, you know, like 
I would want to talk. And that was not at the beginning. That's how it was. And then it really wasn't. So I was like aching for like more and more and more. And when I wasn't getting it, I was, you know, weekend, I would have a conversation like, am I, am I feeling something weird here? Is there something wrong? No, no, no. I want this. I really want. So he, you know, he would separate himself and it would make me, you know, try to get him even more. And then, which would probably push him away by the way. And then, you know, as soon as it was just this back and forth, but you're right that it was these feelings of aching for him to like respond or to need me to, or it was just ridiculous. And that, that terrible feeling, you know, you can't sleep at night. Sometimes you're like wondering when you're going to get the next text or hear from them, or if you did something wrong and that's not a way for anyone to live. It was terrible. (laughs) I didn't even know this person. So it was ridiculous how your brain can do that. Yes, exactly. And so, but like you said, if it's an even thing, if it's, and, and there's actually a study by, by the way, on this, it's Robert Sapolsky and you can look it up. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, he, he did a study on monkeys on this and, um, it, it's, it, uh, that's the study that I'm referencing. So, mm. you know, it, and if you, you know, the study on monkeys was like, if, if the, if they rang the bell, and, 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 you know, they did it every single time. And, you know, they, they knew when they were going to be getting this treat, nothing happened to the dopamine levels in their brain. But if they, if they didn't know when they were going to get the treat and it was intermittent and it, it was, it was just the anticipation, the anticipation of not knowing when yeah. they were going to get the treat, the dopamine levels in their brain rose to the level of cocaine. Wow. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's the, it's the anticipation. It's the not knowing it's the, mm. uh, it's, it's that hot, cold, it's that push pull. And right. so it's the, what you were saying was like those even, um, uh, relationships, the ones that, the, you know, it's the nice guys, right. Right. Uh, that, that, Well, the empathetic ones, the ones that want to communicate with you and see, you know, if you are feeling like there's a lack of something going on, they're willing to talk about it and figure it out as opposed to kind of thrive on that and be like, oh, good, I've got her where I want her, you know? So I think it's, you know, it's obvious when you're in a healthy relationship as opposed to when you're not, when you're not, it feels uncomfortable and then feels amazing and then feels uncomfortable. But I don't think with healthy relationships, it's like that. I mean, I don't know. I haven't had very many. (laughs) Right. But it's it's just a matter of retraining your brain to not need to crave that dopamine and just look for the even and be okay with that. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, most of us who are craving that whole high thing, it's because we did grow up in unhealthy, you know, homes like what you were talking about. Right. And so it's healing yourself and feeling that wholeness and feeling that worthiness in ourselves and knowing that true, authentic, higher version of ourselves and knowing that you're worthy of that. So I thought, you know, what you had said was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and it's so, by the way, it's so obviously, as you know, cause you have a whole show on it and books on it, but you know, falling for these kind of relationships and being in these toxic relationships it's very common. It's very hard. You know, we're all damaged in some way. So it's hard yeah. to get to the work and the place in life where you can identify it, where you can have these boundaries easy. I mean, it's work to, to, to put yourself first a lot. Um, but you know, um, I think that's what we should all strive to remember. Um, you know, when we're in the throes of like, you know, um, giving ourselves away because we are so passionate about being in love. And that goes back to the love addiction. You know, I feel so good but it also feels terrible um, when it doesn't work out. So, um, you know, and it's interesting on my show, Misunderstood, I, I, I've i done a number of episodes on relationships, on narcissistic abuse, on, you know, all that kind of topic, because it is a relatable topic that almost everyone has been touched by in one way or another, either they're one or they're dealing with one, whether it's a parent or a spouse or something along those lines or in a job situation. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, it's such a huge pop, uh, part of the population, right? Yeah. So, um, so you know, knowing who you are, seeing the signs, and you know, being able to, uh, you know, that's the first step. And mm-hmm. so, you know, for you, 
now that you've seen the flags, now you know, and and I think that you've really conquered a lot of it because look at you. I mean, you're, you're you've been able to say, hey, I know what I want. These are my boundaries. I'm good with. I'd rather live a full life on my own than be in a relationship that's n- not serving me. Yeah. Well, that was distracting me. That's a word I kept using. I kept thinking I'm, I'm, I'm distracted. I can't focus because I'm too busy, like looking at my phone. Like when is this person going to call or make a plan with me or, you know, and um, yeah, no, but I, it, as I just said, I don't have, I haven't had many good relationships to, to, to use as a, an example, but I'm, I think the work is in the trying and, and the, the shorter the experiences, you know, cutting off two years of your life wasted with someone who is not the right person um, because of narcissistic tendencies or whatever it may be, um, you know, it gets shorter and shorter. And I, I am at the place where I've done enough work um, and I'm happy enough. And it's so hard to find your purpose and get to a happy enough spot. But when you do find that, um, it's great to have the right boundaries because the, the right person will come along and it's better to be alone and not distracted by the wrong type of thing or person than it is to waste your time and effort. I mean, I feel even though, you know, a couple of days ago, I was like, oh, my God, this is really hurting me. This is upsetting. That's ridiculous. I'm not hurt. I'm not that upset. And I've noticed that I'm completely, you know, back on track with everything that I'm doing. And I, I'm not even thinking about it. So it was just what you're talking about, the cortisol, the dopamine, the adrenaline, whatever it was. And I needed to get through it for a second. Now it's like, it was like a drug went out of my body and I'm fine now. <laughs> oh, so proud of you. So where can people learn more about you and what you're up to and all your good things? Yeah. So my website for my show, it's misunderstoodpodcast.com spelled with M-I-S-S understood. And um, that talks a lot about me, my show, who's coming up on the show. It has links to the show. Um, but yeah, if people want to get to know me, um, my, my show drops twice a week on Mondays and Thursday evenings. And I always interview people that have similar situations to me, people that were reduced to a single headline and they're on a mission to change their narrative. So I have really interesting celebrities and non-celebrities, you know, the non-celebrities are people with, you know, they may be ordinary people, but they have extraordinary stories and it's really fascinating to listen to. And then it's topics also that I think should be reconsidered like what we're talking about here. Um, and uh, every episode is different. And in every episode, I talk a little bit about myself and my personal you know, connection with what they're talking about. So I think it's a good way for people to get to know me, but I'm on Instagram um, at uh, Rachel, you could tell NYC, I think is my Instagram. I read my DM. So um, that's, that's where people can find me. Yeah. And definitely go follow her, go check out her podcast. Um, you know, my episode is going to be there. Um, I don't, I don't know when this episode is going to drop or which one is going to be first, but definitely go check it out. Yep. And, uh, you know, super fascinating. You've got a children's clothing line and a children's store. Uh, don't you have that too still? Or I, I actually used to have it. I closed it a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, it was one of the best things I ever did. I loved it. I love being kind of a Renaissance person and dipping into little things. I won all sorts of awards for best children's store, best baby gifting. Um, I figured out how to have my own clothing line, um, and sold that in the store. I wrote a children's book. So I kind of did that. And then I closed that chapter of my life and I started something, um, new during COVID. I think it was hard to keep that going and retail is smoke and mirrors anyways, for people that say it's not, they're lying. So, um, but I loved it. I was there every day from nine in the morning until seven at night. I I loved interacting with the customers. Um, but no, my focus solely now is my podcast. So, okay. um, Yeah. And I'm working on my memoir and, um, so that's what I'm doing. All right. Well, but you know, you've done a lot of things entrepreneurial, you're, you know, out there doing a lot of amazing things in the world. So, Go check her out. Go follow her. Go listen to her podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really, really appreciate you. You Absolutely. And uh, your episode will be out soon. And I can't wait for people to listen to it as well. 